Okay, so today's lecture is lecture 25, and it's going to be another lecture in which Alice is sending something to Bob, uh, and there's going to be some encoding involved, but it'll be a little bit different because we're discussing cryptography. So, of course, you know, you could teach an entire course on cryptography, and, um, you know, Professor Beeple Goyle does that. I cannot cover hardly anything in one lecture, but I'll do my best to tell you some of the basic tools of cryptography. And one reason I want to do that is, you know, often when you maybe see cryptography for the first time, there's a lot of discussion of, you know, RSA and some particular number theory things. But actually, there's a rich theory of cryptography that ne does not necessarily have anything to do with uh, number theory and so forth. And so I'll try to give you a glimpse of that today. Um, uh, there are many, many textbooks and courses and so forth about uh, theoretical uh, computational cryptography. I just want to highlight this one textbook that I like. It's uh, by Raphael Pass and Abi Shalat. It's called The Course in Cryptography. Okay, so uh, as uh, etymology experts among you know, cryptography really means hidden writing. And uh, that uh, phrase motivates, you know, one of the most basic problems attacked by cryptography, namely how, um, you know, party, Alice, who has a message M that they want to send, can send it to a receiver, Bob, using some kind of encryption scheme that can attempt, you know, via a process that can attempt to foil uh, an eavesdropper with, or an adversary with ill intent. So we have a third character here in the standard Alice Bob setup, Eve, who uh, listens in on the communication between Alice and Bob, at least, and is trying to, you know, uh, learn something about the message here. I guess eavesdropper actually has an A in it, but this is the close one can do uh, uh, with the uh, human names. Okay, so the setup is Alice has a message, M, sometimes called, in, I'll give you the cryptography uh, terminology, it's called the plain text. Imagine it's just a bit string, and then it gets encoded by some encoding map producing uh, another, let's say, bit string C, which is uh, called the ciphertext. And we want that Bob is able to decode the ciphertext and get the message back, but we're concerned about uh, Eve learning something about the message, secret message. So one thing one has to do in the study of, you know, study of cryptography is understand what is it meant by security. And this is something we'll, we'll talk about how to formalize. Uh, you know, at, at a high level, you want somehow that Eve should not get any information about what the message is, M, just by her ability to eavesdrop and learn the message, uh, the encrypted message, C. Um, and it's unclear how exactly you might do this or, or a lot, arrange for this. So one possibility is, you know, maybe you could make this decryption algorithm a secret that only Bob knows. But, you know, this runs into the kinds of problems one always has in, you know, cryptography and secrecy. You know, I mean, the secrets can fall into the wrong hands and, you know, um, you might learn that thing, that decryption algorithm. Or, I mean, people might get suspicious that there are like backdoors or things built into the decryption algorithm. So we don't like the solution. And a uh, basic tenet in most of, you know, computational cryptography theory is that all the algorithms involved should be public knowledge to everyone. So given that, you know, if the, crypt, uh, the decryption algorithm and the encryption algorithm are publicly um, known algorithms, you know, you could just say, well, what's to stop Eve from running the decryption algorithm on the ciphertext? Okay. But uh, the way we get around that is to still have some secret things, but these will be secret inputs to the publicly understood algorithms. So I'll uh, explain more about how this setup will work in subsequent slides. So first I want to talk about the so-called symmetric key model or the shared key model, uh, SKE for um, encryption of messages. And this is um, more limited than maybe the public key encryption model, you know, based on RSA or so forth that you might have heard about if you've heard a little bit of popular discussion of uh, computational cryptography. So in the secret, uh, sorry, the symmetric key model, we still have Alice who has a message. She wants to send it to Bob and Eve is an eavesdropper. Um, but there will be some algorithm called gen, which generates uh, secret keys. And secret keys are also, you can think of them as bit strings, but uh, we'll denote them by two letters, SK. And we're imagining this is a symmetric or shared key setup where the secret key is generated uh, by this generation algorithm. And it's given to Alice and Bob, but not to Eve. OK, and this will be the secret inputs that will help them you know, solve this computation problem or cryptography problem. So now the, we imagine that the um, encryption algorithm uh, takes two inputs. One is the message, and the other is the uh, secret key. Okay. And so the, the ciphertext is a function of that. And uh, now Bob, who also knows the secret key in this story, can uh, decrypt the ciphertext uh, and get back the message, and hopefully is a function of the ciphertext and the secret key. <clears throat> 
So uh, in order for this to make sense, uh, this generation, secret key generation um, algorithm must have a key property, and that's the property of being randomized. So this is um, an essential aspect of all you know, cryptography theory, the use of randomized algorithms for generating uh, keys and running protocols. Uh, point being, I mean, it sounds silly to say it, but I mean, if the key generation algorithm is deterministic, and it's well known, you know, so it's always outputting the same secret key, uh, then, you know, Eve can run it herself and get the secret key, and then she's in the exact same position as Bob. But if the generation algorithm is randomized, then, uh, you know, it you know, puts, I don't know, n-bit strings or something, then, um, you know, Eve can run it herself, but that doesn't help her uh, to know the secret key that Alice and Bob agreed on. So uh, now we must start to address the question of what security of such a scheme can mean. And uh, as always, I mean, feel free to interrupt even audio with audio for questions, but you can also type them into the chat. And there's lots of possibilities. You might say that, okay, like maybe we should try to formalize that Eve shouldn't learn anything about the message in some information theoretic way, or maybe we could try to formalize that the ciphertext looks random from Eve's point of view. Um, but uh, to cut the story short, um, a key idea that's been developed in the, the course of, you know, the computer science theory of cryptography is to base security around the notion of simulability, which is to say that, um, you know, uh, anything Eve can sort of learn from the ciphertext, she should be able to simulate learning herself even without Alice and Bob sending these messages. So uh, let's make a definition here. And this will be a definition for concerning symmetric key encryption schemes. And the term we're defining is perfectly secure. And let me take a brief moment before I read the definition to emphasize that this, uh, we're defining a technical term here, just like we always do in mathematics. Um, and the term is called perfectly secure, which is a very suggestive name, uh, but it's merely a mathematical definition. And it might not necessarily comport with like, an intuitive human level meaning of like what is perfectly secure. So I mean, you might imagine, okay, oh, what about in the scenario if Eve can, I don't know, listen in on the secret key generation or, you know, what if uh, there's some like timing attacks that Eve can do and so forth and maybe this is not perfectly secure. Certainly all these things have to always be considered when you're studying cryptography, but you know, um, even though it's just such a phrase, we're just making a mathematical definition here called perfectly secure, which you can argue about whether it comports with your notion of reality. In any case, we say that a SKE, uh, a symmetric key encryption scheme, which consists of these three algorithms, key generation, encoding, and decoding, is perfectly secure if for every pair of messages, M0 and M1, that Alice might want to send, and for every potential ciphertext string C that she might send, we have an equality be two prob between two probabilities. And these probabilities are uh, when you, you know, do Alice's, basically Alice's role with message M0 and Alice's role with message S1. So you um, draw the secret key from the generation algorithm and you encode the message zero from, with the secret key. We look at the probability that this results in the ciphertext C. And that should be the same for all pairs of messages and all ciphertext C. So basically what it's saying is there's one probability distribution over ciphertexts, perhaps the informed distribution, perhaps something else, but um, your scheme should have the property that for any message you're encoding, when you encode it, and when you do that, you have to get a randomized, you, you get a random string because the generation, the key generation is random. When you encode it, you get that probability distribution on ciphertext. And this is a reasonable scheme because, I mean, it means from Eve's point of view, no matter what the message is, she sees a ciphertext whose probability distribution is the same. You know, you can imagine the uniform distribution case. So no matter what the message is, um, she sees a random string, then, you know, that's a reasonable notion of uh, the communication being secure. Uh, this is also called Shannon security because, you know, our hero Claude Shannon also invented this notion back uh, in the early days in the 40s. Okay, and there's a well-known solution to this problem. Uh, perhaps you've seen it before. If you have, feel free to type it into the chat. Uh, OTP, yes, one-time pad. In fact, we discussed it yesterday, or not yesterday, but in the last lecture. Uh, the one-time pad achieves perfect security, and um, it's a simple uh, solution if you haven't seen it before. 
So here it is. Um, given a parameter n, uh, you're going to have uh, this scheme where m, the mes messages, and c, the ciphertext, and also sk, the secret keys, are all n-bit strings. And it's pretty simple. The key generation algorithm just chooses a random n-bit string. And then to, for Alice to encode her message m with the secret key, she just XORs them together bitwise. OK, and for Bob to decode the message, he takes the ciphertext and also encode, um, XORs it bitwise with the secret key, which he knows. And you know, XORing twice cancels things out. So this correctly recovers you know, the message from Bob's point of view. And furthermore, let's try to, uh, OK, so that's a, a check mark. It's sort of like a correct scheme. Uh, Bob gets the correct uh, decryption with 100% chance. And let's check that it satisfies this definition of being perfectly secure. Uh, well, in fact, it does. And the reason is, under this scheme, uh, for every n-bit message and every n-bit ciphertext, the probability over the choice of the secret key that the encryption of the message will equal that ciphertext, well, it's 2 to the minus n, because this uh, event occurs if and only if the secret key is equal to the XOR of the message in the ciphertext, this fixed M and C. And um, you know, some fixed strings, the probability that a uniformly random string is equal to that string is two to the minus n. <clears throat> so the one-time pad has the property that from like, let's say E's point of view, you know, if Alice encodes one message of her choice, no matter what it is, when she encodes it with this one-time pad, sends it to Bob, uh, what Eve sees is a uniformly random string. So she learns nothing about the message. Uh, okay, so great. You might say, all right, problem solved. We are done. Game over. Uh, we got it. Well, sort of, yeah. I mean, uh, this scheme does achieve perfect uh, security, but we might want more because there are some issues with this one-time pad scheme. One issue with it is it has some sort of inefficiency to it. In particular, the secret key here is of length, the number of bits equal to the length of the message. So our secret keys are longer than, in fact, equal to in length, to the length of the message. This is kind of a drag, um, but it's, uh, it's not hard to show that this property is necessary for any scheme which achieves perfect sec security. And because this property is kind of a drag, we're gonna relax our notion of perfect security in a moment. But it's kind of a drag because, you know, I mean, you know, if you want to send like, you know, some piece of text, you need to store this gigantic, equally long random string. And, uh, you know, these string, these secret keys are hard to keep around. They require secret agreement. And perhaps another major problem is that this scheme is terrible if you use it more than one time, hence the phrase uh, one time in the name. And um, probably you all know or have seen the reason uh, if you, why it's so bad to reuse the secret key. I mean, if Alice sends two messages, M0 and M1, uh, then um, under this scheme, if she sends M0 and M1, then uh, they both get encrypted by XORing with the same secret key. And so uh, the two ciphertexts, C0 and C1, have the property that C0 XOR C1, this is my terrible mouse writing, is the same as M0 XOR M1. And that's pretty bad um, because the Eve can compute C0 XOR C1 herself and she gets the XOR of uh, the two messages that Alice sent. And, you know, if you get the XOR of two, you know, English language messages, you know, a good uh, crypt analyst can probably figure out the two messages. So it's, it's terrible to reuse this scheme. So there's some problems with the one-time pad and that's, you know, uh, what different cryptographic schemes are uh, developed for to try to get around these problems. So a goal that you might have is to you know, come up with a scheme where you have a, a particularly short secret key, maybe not too long, you know, some thousand bits or 10,000 bits, but that lets you encrypt lots of messages, you know, multiple rounds of messages. Alice can you know, do several messages. Their total length can be much longer than 10,000 or 1,000 bits. Um, that would be cool. But as we see, we're going to have to relax our definition of perfect security if we want to achieve this. Um, question asks, what gen deck enc is not perfect? What if it's not perfect? Does it mean Eve can infer the message? Well, um, if you have a 
scheme which is not does not satisfy this definition of perfect security that it means that like in short um, different messages that Alice might send might induce different probability distributions um, on ciphertext and therefore this will give um, uh, Eve some non-trivial better than trivial chance of guessing what the message is so we're going to exactly sort of talk about that like what if uh, maybe you don't have perfect security, but these probability distributions on ciphertext are not the same, but are for different messages, but are very similar. Uh, now, there's an issue here, um, which is that uh, if you're trying to model Eve as an attacker, there's no way we can, I mean, an attack that she can always try is to just like try all possible secret keys that Alice and Bob might be using, you know, decrypt with each one and see if, you know, that leads to a message that looks plausible. So there's no way around that. And that sort of suggests that, um, well, it suggests that uh, we want to take computational complexity into account. So, I mean, maybe we might choose not to worry about that too much because, you know, if there's two to the, you know, if secret keys are like a thousand bits, so there are two to the 1,000 possible secret keys. I think it's reasonable to assume that like, well, we're not concerned about an attack where Eve tries all possible two to the 1,000 keys. 